so um, how to deepen the meditation is something which I was just uh, mentioning a few minutes ago in an interview, which I think is really important, is learning how to develop happiness in one's meditation. Uh, to develop that happiness, sometimes it's what you have to do deliberately when you start meditating. So you don't just sort of put your, you know, your bottom on the, the cushion or the chair and say, okay, now I'm going to meditate. The preparation is really important. You find if you're in a negative mood or if you're tired and you're fed up and you think, well, I'm supposed to meditate, I'd better meditate, you're wasting your time. You start with negativity and the mind will never engage and never find any peace. But if you develop happiness first of all, then of course it does work. The mind gets energy, it gets joy, and it's easy to meditate. The saying of the Buddha, which I've often repeated in my talks to the monks, is a saying in Pali which is repeated many times in the suttas. Sukhino jitang samadhiyati. From happiness, the mind, the jitta, is easily become still. It's easy to meditate. From happiness is its source. It's a very powerful little lesson there, which the Buddha mentioned. If you start with a suffering mind, it's very hard to actually to get some deep meditation. So you have to somehow develop a bit of happiness, first of all. And an example of that I was saying, very often when I go to places like the BTF, <laughs> Sometimes you make me work very hard and sometimes you get very tired at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, you know, travelling around, talking to people, photo, signing books. <laughs> I'm a human being, so physically you get tired. But at the end of the evening, you know, it's time to meditate because it's too early to go to bed. And there's been many occasions when I've just been exhausted. You know, it's too early to go to bed, but it's just so tired. But you know, I have my understanding of how to meditate. So I sit in that little room upstairs, you know, where you give me in the BGF. Sit down there and just slump. But then, instead of trying to meditate or watch my breath, what I do is start to remember all of the service which I've given that day. And all of the Dhamma which I have taught all the people who I have helped, all of the, the assistance I've given to people to lessen their suffering, to see another way of living life, to you know, forgive the faults of others, to feel at peace with themselves, uh, to deal with the sicknesses and troubles. And as I start remembering and recalling all that which I have given that day, I get this huge surge of energy. My back straightens up, my tiredness disappears and I feel just so happy, so energised and then I meditate and I get some really nice meditations that way and that means I don't get um, overcome by that sloth and torpor. Physically, you know, I've been quite tired but mentally I get so bright, who cares about the physical? My mind is bright and happy. Because you know, I remembered I remembered that when I was a young man, and you see some of the photographs in that uh, biography book of mine, but not all of them, thank goodness. <laughs> like many other young men, used to go out late at night, go to concerts, you know, dances, parties. And sometimes you stay up till 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, sometimes you stay up all night. You know, kids, even kids. But when I ever stayed up all night, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, I never had sloth and torpor when I was with my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and why was that? I thought, why? It's because you're enjoying it. You've got happiness. You've got fun. And when I started meditating, especially doing these all-night meditations, that's what I started to think about. Two o'clock in the morning, why am I tired? was because I was not putting happiness and joy into my meditation. And that was the key. So it's so important if you're meditating to start off with some joy. So how do we um, get that joy? Just like myself, because you know, I can't give monetary donations because I've got no money, I'm a monk. But there's many other things which I can do. And some of the things like 
I'm sitting here now in this jhana cloak. But you know that I was the, the person behind this. You know, I was the one who sort of decided, yes, let's go ahead with this, to give that leadership, to push it through the committee, to start the fundraising. And even, you know, you've even seen me actually doing some of the building as well. And even my monks as well. And they always remember that, that part, uh, yeah, that part over there, which was, no, this, this part over here you're sitting on. This part over here you're sitting on was made by a few monks, Santuti, Mitra, and a few others, from about uh, 10 o'clock at night to about 3 o'clock in the morning, on the day before we were opening. <laughs> we, the people were supposed to be laying, it didn't turn up, and it's getting later and later, and so it was the last day, we were going to have the big opening ceremony the following morning, and so a few of the monks, I stayed up to about 10 or 11, but then I went back, but they stayed up to, I forget what time it was, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, just to finish this and make this beautiful job. So that's the floor you're sitting on. Now, what that does, wow. I mean, these are monks, what they do for you. And what I did. And that gives you this incredible sense of joy and inspiration. This is beautiful, this is really good. So that's the dana which we can do as monks. And all the dana if you've done as well. I mean, I mean, many, many times I went over to, you know, Kuala Lumpur, and especially I remember that great dinner which we did, which raised a lot of money. And so that's your part of this amazing good karma of making a place where people can come on retreat, where you can come as well. That's because of you. And so you start thinking about that. Wow, I did this. I'm part of this. My generosity has done such an amazing thing for others. And once you start developing those thoughts, and you don't just think, oh, that was nothing. No, it wasn't nothing. It was wonderful. It was big. You know, developed the Buddhist Gem Fellowship, especially you, Victor, being the president and leader for such a long time. How many people have you helped by doing that? Sometimes they don't tell you. But hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people have been through that place. And because you've given up your time, given your leadership to make that happen, and each one of you as well, you think, wow, that's my Jaganusati. It's a recollection of your giving, of your generosity in goods and in time. And once you start thinking about that, you start recalling it, pondering on it, staying a long time with it, you get this big surge of energy and happiness and joy. And then you meditate. Then your meditation goes really, really well. Because you're starting off with that happiness. It's pure happiness. It's good happiness. And if that doesn't work, we have all these other meditations which the Buddha taught, like Buddha Anusati. I don't know if how many of you have been on pilgrimage to places in India. I was mentioning earlier, I think, in one of the talks I gave here. You go on those pilgrimages and you know you're sitting in a place where the Buddha sat. You're walking where the Buddha walked. You go to Bodh Gaya, that's the place where the Buddha became enlightened. And you can actually sit there. You're there. In the very place which you read about in all those um, books where the Buddha sat in the three watches of the night and became fully enlightened, the Buddha, and you can sit there. And I sat there, and when I remember that, ooh, <laughs> that makes you tingle, and that makes you get very energized. It's not just where the Buddha became enlightened, all those other places where you've been on pilgrimage, and you remember that. And when you remember that, that's like a Buddha Anusati, recollection of the Buddha, the life of the Buddha, the power of the Buddha. And that gives you so much energy. It inspires you. That inspiration is called, we have an English word for it, enthusiasm. And enthusiasm actually comes from a word, it, with a thus, enthusiasm actually comes from theos. It means like being in, uh, imbued with like God energy. So it always was a very religious thing, enthusiasm. 
and we actually develop that enthusiasm, that inspiration for a Buddha. And once you do that, you get this great source of energy. And then meditation is easy. And that's one of the other um, meditations. And we've got Dhamma Anusati. And for Dhamma Anusati, that's uh, inspiration from the teachings. Sometimes if I'm dull, I remember some of the great teachings. And what did Ajahn Chah say? And I remember some of his teachings. I think, wow, that is really amazing. That is deep. Now, you wanted a talk on non-self. You know, one of that personal teachings, which still really just, whoo, gives me so much a boost of energy every time I recollect it. And that was that time. Uh, Ajahn Chah was still actively teaching, but he was starting to become sick. And the Western monks at this Wat Nana Chat monastery, we were very smart. Because, you know, you always want your teacher to come around. You want him to sort of find some way of getting them as much as possible. And so we thought, let's build a sauna. Because saunas were actually something which was allowed in the Vinaya. You know, we started looking at the Vinaya and had this, it's called a Jantagara, the hot room. And we read about it, it was a sauna. So saunas were not invented, you know, in sort of Scandinavia. They become famous for it, but they were in India as well. In, uh, in the time of the Buddha. So we, we made a very simple sauna. And the idea was we'd invite Ajahn Chah every week to come and have a sauna. We found out that it's, it's traditional Buddhist and it's good for your health. But really that was just, that was just, you might call the, the, uh, the carrot. It was like the, the free gift. It was like the marketing strategy because our main purpose was to get him to come to our monastery. So yeah, we did care about his health, but I must admit, personally, I cared more that he you know he'd come and give a talk. <laughs> I'm honest. So he would come every week, he'd give a talk, and then he'd have his sauna, and then he'd go back. So we'd have him once a week coming to visit us, and of course, we'd always look forward to the the the, the talk. Now, sometimes all monks, you know, even the best monks, sometimes their talks are really inspiring. They hit the spot either they're inspired or you're in that state of mind that you're open to a great talk. And I remember on one occasion that was he just gave this very brilliant talk. And once, you know, you hear very inspiring Dhamma, oh, it's just so beautiful. And your mind gets so peaceful when you hear the joyful teachings. Now my mind was so joyfully inspired by Dhamma Nusati I just heard from the great teacher. I would usually go and help Ajahn Shah, you know, with you know, washing his bathing cloth, handing him his towel, whatever else, at the sauna. But that was just, there was other monks there. This was too good an opportunity to miss. My mind was inspired and happy. So I went to behind the hall where I could find a quiet place, sat down to meditate. And of course, you know, in those days you don't have clocks, you don't worry about half an hour or an hour, just go into a very nice meditation. Because of the inspiration of hearing a good Dharma talk, it was so easy to meditate. We got very peaceful, very joyful. And, you know, when you get into nice meditations, when you come out, you don't know how much time has gone by. You haven't got a clue, you know, how many hours or minutes I've been sitting there. But the thought was of gratitude to your teacher. So my first thought was, I'm going to go and see if I can help my teacher. Maybe you know, there was something I could still do. Probably he was gone. But neither of them was right because as I was walking on the path towards the sauna, I saw him walking towards me in the opposite direction. He'd finished the sauna, he'd clothed up, and he was on his way back to the car to send him back to Wat Bapo, his monastery, which was only about six kilometers away. It was a narrow path, there was no choice, no turning back, I was going to pass my teacher. And as I came closer to him, and he was with two other Thai men, the driver and somebody else, I forget who, as we came closer, he stopped and looked at me. Because he had noticed, and he's a great monk, he noticed that I'd got into a very deep state of meditation just a few minutes ago. 
as I told many of you in the monastery, when you have a deep meditation, that is a time that you are ripe for insight. The five hindrances have been abandoned. Your mind is clear. Those are the moments when people become enlightened. So Ajahn Chah checked me out. He was reading my mind. You could feel that. He's, I was wise enough and smart enough to know he went right inside of me to check and realize that I was free of all the, the hindrances because I'd had a nice meditation. So he decided to try it and enlighten me. So he looked at me. He, he had a very strong mind. You can grab someone just with your eyes. He grabbed me with his, my eyes and held my attention. And that's when he said, Brahma Wangsa, why? That's what he said. Brahma Wangsa, why? Do you know the answer to that? But I answered. It came out of my mouth automatically. I don't know. <laughs> I was still a young monk. <laughs> You know, I didn't know. I was just stupid. And it's ex your response was exactly his response. Great monks never get angry at you. They never scold you. He just burst out laughing. He thought, you know, these Westerners, they might go to Cambridge, but they're just so dumb. <laughs> but then his, his facial expression changed again. He became serious. He looked at me and he said, Brahma Wangsa, I will tell you the answer. So if anybody ever again asks you the question why, this is the correct answer. And I got really excited. I remember that moment because this was a great monk. It was a personal teaching. As deep as you can go, he was asked, telling me the answer to the great question why. And what he said was, Brahm, there's nothing. There's nothing. That's the answer to the question why. There's nothing. I thought, wow. And then he looked at me again. He said, do you understand? I said, yes. He said, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and then he laughed and walked away. <laughs> I accepted that. Just, yeah, I could understand intellectually, you know, theoretically, yeah, emptiness, non-self. Yeah, I understand that. You understand that. You've read the books. You've heard monks like me talk. You've heard Ajahn Chah say that so many times. Yeah, there's nothing. He said, no, you don't understand. But I always carried that teaching with me, like a little personal teaching from a great monk. The answer to the question why? There's nothing. If ever I want to be inspired, that's what I... I can recall that experience. You know, there's things... It doesn't matter if you've got a good memory or a bad memory, there's some things which you'll never forget. I can just visualize right now, just that interchange. Wow. So when I remember that, that really inspires me. That's non self. There's nothing. <laughs> nothing there. Oh, what bliss. <laughs> That's just so simple, but so deep. So if I ever I want to sort of get inspired, I remember those teachings. The Dhamma, which you've heard. Maybe that, not that teaching. Maybe there's something else you've heard from some monk or some nun or you read it in the book and it's really hit the spot. It's something which may have been those few words which have actually made you a Buddhist or made you come to the monastery or, or really changed your whole life. And those words you remember. And whenever you're down, you remember that Dhamma. My goodness, it inspires you. It just lifts you up. This is something amazingly powerful. The problem is that we just don't remember to use those powerful recollections. The Dhamma Nisati. And of course, the next Anusati, these are all meditations. Sangha Nisati. You remember the great monks you've lived with, the nuns who have inspired you. You recollect them. That's why... I don't mind having books or photos. But if you have a photo and you're inspired you know, by what I've said or by my example, then keep that photo. Have you got the photo, say, this afternoon when you, or when you went into my cave? Now, a monk, a real monk, a real monk's cave, that's where I actually live. 
It's not a tourist place. As soon as you were gone, I was back in there. Now that should hopefully, some of you, that might inspire you. So you can put that up on your on your um, meditation shrine where you meditate. And you say, wow, I've been in that cave. Wow. It gives you inspiration. There's one monk <laughs> in that book. That was that monk Ajahn Gunha. He's still around. He's been through Malaysia. But he was really, really a great monk. And I had a picture of him in that book when he visited Bodhinyan and I was just walking behind him. And he's just got this incredible infectious smile. Every time I see that, there's no way I can be sad, upset or whatever. You know, it's, it's a crazy smile. It's a smile I've never seen on any other Thai monk. Not even Ajahn Chah had a smile like that. It, <laughs> his jaw is open. It's like he's bursting out laughing, which he did very often. It's an infectious smile. If, if anyone gets depressed, that picture of Ajahn Gunha, if you're still depressed after that, you're no hoper. It's just this brilliant, peaceful, but happy, joyful. It just <laughs> inspires you. And if you know monks like that, if you know who they are, where that smile comes from, oh, that's really beautiful. So that's why it's okay to have you know pictures of like Sangha, which you know you really get inspired by because you look at that before you meditate. And you think, wow, and what a wonderful time it is to be a Buddhist. There's still great beings around who can teach the Dharma and can inspire people. And that really gives you a heap of energy. And then you meditate. And of course, you go into deep meditation then. Or, oh, we've already said about you know, your generosity. The other one, which I haven't mentioned, is Sila Nisati. You know, your precepts. You know, sometimes people just undervalue just keeping, say, five precepts or eight precepts. I've heard from Victor that most of you kept eight precepts. It's incredible. It's amazing. You've done so well. Food is available for you. Did you want to be said? No. Never underestimate the power of a person who keeps precepts. Sometimes that uh, people say, well, what's the point of precepts? It actually just makes you happier. Yeah, you have your good days and bad days, but it's like the tide rising in the in the ocean. The highs, the lows, the average happiness goes higher and higher and higher the more you keep your precepts. That's why the precepts are fun. It's a fun thing to do, to keep precepts. Some people in the world say, oh, if you keep precepts, you can't enjoy yourself. You know, you just... You can't drink. I've heard that. So people actually in Singapore, they said, oh, if you're a Christian, you can have fun. You can go out and get drunk. and You can do all these things. If you're a Buddhist, you, know, you can't do anything. But that's actually not the way it works. If you really do keep your precepts, then actually you have much more fun and much more joy. You can see that on a person's face. Now look at the monks and nuns you've seen. I'm talking about the ones who actually keep their precepts. They're really happy people. And that's one of the reasons I've said, I mean, I've said this, I think the first time I went to the BGF, I said, this, this is my advertising and my marketing strategy, my marketing tool. <laughs> <laughs> the smile. <laughs> it works. And it gets lots of people interested. They want to become Buddhist. I remember this lady, I, so she was... Uh, the president before Dennis, Rachel. <laughs> and she's an amazing lady. She had this anxiety disorder, uh, panic attacks. You know, and panic attacks, they happen. You don't know when they're going to happen. You can be just on the aircraft. You can be just on the way to work. You'll be in the shopping center and suddenly you just freeze. And it, it, it really embarrasses you. You just can't do anything. It's like you suddenly struck down and you, you're frozen. And she had a couple of these attacks which came out of nowhere. And it, you know, it happens to many, many people. You never know when or why. And so she decided that meditation might help her. So that's why she came to listen to the monks because you know we're the experts on meditation. You know, the, the Buddhists, we invented meditation. The only trouble was we forgot to get the patent. Now everybody else is teaching meditation as well. <laughs> but... 
she went to listen to some meditation talks by the monks, but what really struck her is that these guys are happy. And when she told me, she said that was a happiness she never saw in her corporate life. She said this was really weird. How can you know she was an Australian girl? How can these people be happy when they you know can't have sex, they can't watch movies, they can't sort of go drinking, they can't go partying, they can't do this, they can't do that, they can't do anything. That's why you know that that old story about why they call them nuns. Did none of this, none of that, none of anything else. <laughs> That's a terrible, <laughs> but anyhow. So, how can you be happy when you can't do what you want? But she saw actually they were happy. And at first, I remember she uh, she wrote a little uh, booklet about herself, and she said at first she thought we were just faking it. You know that when you you know in public you smile, but in real life you know you're just mean and miserable and nasty like anybody else. But you know you put your face on in public. But then she said, no, I'm going to check these guys out. So she started coming to the monastery, following us around. And she said, well, actually, it's real. There is real happiness. And so when you've been following me around, you're driving me around, you, know, you stay in the monastery, you can catch me out any any time. So you see, there's actually real happiness there. And that's the happiness of keeping precepts. You know, living under these Patimoka precepts you know, for... Was it now 38 years now? 37 years? Yeah, 37 years, that's right. So there is happiness from precepts, and you have that happiness too. So remember it. It's called Sila Nusati. You remember your precepts, your goodness. And that makes you feel so good, it increases your self-esteem. It brings that feeling of happiness, which overcomes the dullness and the negativity. You start in your happiness, which means, yeah, you're getting joy, which makes it easy to meditate. But the last way to develop happiness, because sometimes you are in a mess, you are suffering. Life is difficult sometimes. You may get a message from home that somebody's really sick or a friend has died or you lost all your money in the stock market or whatever happens. So sometimes life is painful. But there's another little teaching of the Buddha. He says... When life is painful, when you're having a difficult time, then remember the Dhamma. That's what the Buddha said, it's the Four Noble Truths. He said, look, this has happened in life. This life is not perfect, it's a difficult life. You will always have pain, disappointment and suffering. That's par for the course. But when you actually experience that suffering, you know that you are not exempt either, no one is exempt. You never take it as a personal failure because what the Buddha said, it's nothing to do with you. It's not a personal failure. Everybody has to go through that without any exception. Even the Buddha was criticized many, many times. Twice, well, once, remember Chincha? She accused the Buddha of making her pregnant and she came with just a big fat belly. You know, it was all false. But, you know, the Buddha had to take that blame. No, at least at first, until you know the the thing which she put under her belly sort of fell off, and she realised that she was faking it. But everybody has to go through some pain and suffering at times. But we remember, this is what the Buddha said, and it's not a personal failure. A lot of times in disappointments, whether it's uh, failure in business or failure in your career or your child dies, a lot of time we think we failed somewhere. We add that guilt to it. We shouldn't have done that. We should have done something more. And that personal failing where we add the self to it, now that's what really causes the worst suffering. And when we realise, oh, this is just par for the course. This happens. We can't avoid it. It will happen to us sooner or later. And then we get this beautiful sense of peace. Yeah, we're suffering, but this is part of being in this world. And it's not my fault, it's just part of the world. As I keep on saying, dogs bark, they go woof woof, cats, they meow. Rabbits, what do rabbits go, Danya? <laughs> Husbands snore, wives nag. <laughs> That's just their nature. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
So because of that, why suffer? It's just the world. So when you don't realize it's no one's fault, you just make peace with it. It's just life. So we allow it to be. We can love suffering. We open the door of our heart to the suffering and pain in the world. We're at peace with it. The door of my heart is open to life, no matter what it gives us. Not just the pleasant stuff, but even the suffering as well. We open our heart to it. And that is where we find this beautiful sense of peace. So from suffering, we get peace. And that gives us this great sense of joy again. Wow, even in suffering, I understand it now. It inspires us. And this is actually one of the teachings of the Buddha. How to become enlightened, to experience suffering. It gives you faith in the Buddha's teachings. You understand the Buddha's teachings now. And that gives you this beautiful inspiration. It brings this pity up, this joy. In the midst of the worst pain and suffering and disappointment, we get inspiration. The Buddha was right. This is our way. Do this. And that inspiration leads to this beautiful stillness, happiness, jhanas, seeing things as they truly are, leaving the world, things fading away, enlightenment, the whole works. So even you can take suffering and turn it into bliss by understanding, reflecting on the Buddha's teachings. But on every stage for each of these little examples, it's the happiness, the joy, that is what we develop. So when you're meditating in the next couple of days, those of you who are staying here or when you go home, those of you who are meditating here for the next you know, two months or however long, or 20 years, kapal, 30 years, 100 years, <laughs> when you meditate, don't just sit there. Think breathing in, breathing out. Okay, what else can I do? That's not working. I'm sweeping the body. How do my toes feel? What do you mean about my toes feel? They're just toes. What's the what am I doing this for? You see that type of negativity? You're just wasting your time. So develop that sense of joy. Oh, what bliss to be able to meditate. That's all I want. Just the very fact that I'm sitting here meditating is enough for me. Ah, oh, just all of the good monks sitting where the Buddha sat, listening to the Dhamma, keeping precepts, all my generosity and kindness. Oh, what joy. And if you're not rich, there's many ways you can be kind and be generous. You know that story? I mean, you've heard all these stories. These are golden oldies. But I remember that <laughs> time being with Ajahn Chah. And it was really weird for a Westerner to see these customs. And one of the customs was that when we'd, we'd always go on arms round barefoot. So when we came back, we had this place for washing the feet. So, you know, you put your foot in this uh, little trough of water and you swish them around and then dry them on a cloth and then you kept coming in the room. But when Ajahn Chah came back from arms round, he didn't have to wash his feet he put his foot close and all these monks would jump up, maybe about 20 monks around him to wash his feet. And as a Westerner, I thought, that's going too far. You know, uh, Ajahn Shah, you know, he's old enough to wash his own feet. He doesn't need any, any help. <laughs> what are they doing that for? It's stupid. You know, just these customs in Asia, I thought, because I was a Westerner. I said, I'm never going to do that. But of course, you know, that one day he decided, let's give it a try. Because, you know, you're a scientist, you know, give it a try, what's this all about? But I realised from experience that you had to be fast. <laughs> because as soon as he came close, all these monks would jump up and they'd actually run. So I was ready. It was like, you know, like Usain Bolt before the, the gun went for the 100 metres final in the Olympic Games. You know, I was coiled up, ready to go. And as soon as the gun went off, as soon as I saw Ajahn Shah, I you know, jumped up and sprinted. And you know what? I got a toe. <laughs> All to myself. <laughs> I got a toe of my teacher. 
stupid was that afterwards, but I was just so excited. And that stayed with me all that stayed with me for years. And just the joy of giving, of washing a toe of your teacher. I shouldn't have said that because you'll be grabbing my toes. <laughs> you're pulling them off. But that was just so much fun. When I went afterwards, it, that is why these monks were doing that. It gives you so much joy and happiness. And then they would meditate. That was part of meditation practice. Washing a toe of your teacher. And that just lifted up the lifted up the meditation enormously. And this is actually understand about the happiness and the joy. So just stupid things, you know, which you do. You know, just for each other, just opening the door. I remember just it was in the book over there, just Remember some of the stories. There was one of the monks, some that you know his name, that's Ajahn Munindo, he's over in Harnam now. Just you know, this was the early days and it was very tough and harsh. And he said, Ah, oh, you know, just what I'd really like in the morning is a cup of tea at three AM when the bell goes, you know, so I can have a nice meditation instead of being so dull. He said, I'll get you one. He said, Yeah, of course you will. And when I say something, I do it. So I got up about two thirty. You know, he didn't sleep very much, but it was just for fun. 2.30, made a cup of tea, and was at his door about five minutes to three, before the bell went, knocking on his door. Here's a cup of tea for you. you know, he enjoyed the tea, but no mu not as much as I did. It was just so much fun, you know, like looking after a fellow monk and giving him a cup of tea and when he wakes up in the morning. And that's just... That's the sort of thing which I've encouraged for the other minds, just doing nice things for each other, looking after each other. It gives you so much joy and happiness. So people who are selfish, they're not just selfish, they're stupid. You're missing out on just a huge amount of happiness and joy in life. So look after each other, do ridiculous things for each other. You know, if it's someone who's a bit sort of um, sad, just go make them some breakfast and give it to them in bed in their room in Jhana Grove. Whatever. It's, it's a nice thing to do. <laughs> a silly thing to do, but why not? That gives you a lot of joy and happiness. And that joy and happiness is not just for indulgence. That is what makes good a beautiful meditation. That's one of the reasons I've got good meditation. It's not just because I have good meditation, therefore I'm happy. Because I'm happy, therefore I have good meditation. The two come together then. So the way to increase your meditation is to develop a happy mind. Don't be so fault-finding. You know, at home, at work, the government, you know, the, the faculty, whatever. It's just, this is, that's what they do. But develop as much happiness as possible. So not developing a fault-finding mind, but a happy mind. Happy mind which can let go of the pain but which you can cultivate and keep and develop on the positive side of life, yourself and others, and develop all of those reflections. And that way you get so much energy, so much joy. When you meditate, oh, oh it's just so easy. Oh, this is nice. So that's where you get a great meditation from, developing joy first. Okay, so that's the little talk on a bit of non-self, but also... How to improve your meditation. So, now for a bit of Q&A. Because unfortunately, that you know what I'm like, that people invite me to places and I say yes too many times. So it's about a year ago now, this uh, group in Sydney, it's a very good organisation, invited me to come to Sydney this time for the, the psychology conference. So that's why I'm going there tomorrow morning. So unfortunately I won't be able to be here on the... Uh, on Saturday or Sunday for you, on Saturday rather, to give you a talk. So, but on Saturday evening, if you're interested, if you're really that hungry for more talks, we have a Sutta class you know, for the uh, residents of, uh, for the Anagarikas and Novices at Bodhinyana, you're most welcome. Ajahn Bamani will be doing that one. So you're, if you're really hungry, you can always you know, walk over there or get a ride over there for the Sutta class. I'm sure that you can arrange that, uh, Daniel. Yeah. So that if you're really sort of even more hungry, but if you know, if you want if if you don't want to actually to go and see it live, you can always have what we call like takeaway. There's lots of CDs stuff from the internet you can take away from there and listen sort of at home, listen in your room. There's lots of dhamma there. 
But anyway, I said, I apologise. That's why I came this evening, because I can't come tomorrow or Saturday. So, now, any comments, questions or complaints? The three C's. Are you tired? See, I was tired when I came in here, but I'm all inspired again now. <laughs> no questions? Did you have a nice time while you were here? Remember that now you've come here, you know what the place is like, you can always come back again. And do what like some people do. You don't always have to come in a group. Once you've been here and you know the place, we have these self-retreats. So when there is no organized retreat, and we have a teacher teaching every day, when there's no organized retreat, people are welcome to come on self-retreat. So they, uh, you know, they say they've been here before, they give usually Danny a call, make sure there's no one else here, then you just come along and look after yourself. The same system, we just, you know, the breakfast is there, you make your own breakfast, have enough tea and coffee, whatever there. You know, now we, there's so many uh, <laughs> people come from Malaysia and Singapore and places where we have lots and lots of noodles. <laughs> so it's not just, you know, cornflakes, not just Western food, you have whatever food you like. <laughs> and you can always bring a whole heap if you think that that's, the noodles here are not as nice as the noodles in in uh, KL, you bring your own stash. And then, <laughs> and then you just come over for the lunch to the bloody mile, walk over there, walk back again, or get a lift. It's a nice, simple lifestyle. So you buy yourself looking after yourself all day. It's a nice, peaceful time. And of course, you know, it's very comfortable accommodation with the rooms and the en suites. So, you're most welcome to come back again. You have a question? Yeah. Okay, that is wrong. But it's still what I usually say is that once there were these two Australian Buddhists, one was called Sam. Sam. Atta. And his, va his wife was called Vi. Vi Pasana. So Sam and Vi, one day after lunch, decided to go on a walk. They wanted to go up Meditation Mountain. So Sam and Vi went up Meditation Mountain, but they took their dog with them. And their dog was called Metta. So Sam, Atta, Vi, Pasana, and Metta the dog went up a walk on a walk up Meditation Mountain. Now Sam, Sam, his idea of going up Meditation Mountain was for the peace. Because on the top of Meditation Mountain it was just so quiet, so silent. The peace was amazing on top of Meditation Mountain. His wife, Vi, she wanted to go up there for the view. Because on top of Meditation Mountain you could see forever get so many insights into the whole universe on top of Meditation Mountain because the view was forever. And Meta the dog, she just went up there for fun. Like dogs do, they don't think too much. <laughs> so Sam, Vi and Meta the dog walked up Meditation Mountain. And even halfway up, oh, it was so peaceful. So Sam was just so happy. And Vi, oh, she could still get a Great view, even halfway up. And Meta the dog, strange, the higher they got, the more that Meta the dog wagged her little tail. She was getting happier and happier the higher they got up Meditation Mountain. And when they got to the top of Meditation Mountain, oh, Sam was so delighted. It was so still and peaceful up there. But you know, Sam had a pair of eyes too. So even though he went up there for the silence and the peace, he also enjoyed the magnificent view, the great insights. His wife, Vi, she saw such great insights. She was getting her camera, getting the view to keep all her insights, but she could experience the peace as well. 
was so still out there, she also enjoyed the peace. I met with a dog. You know what a dog is like when it gets excited and happy. It was running around in circles. The happiest dog on the whole planet. The reason is because on top of Meditation Mountain is incredible peace, but also the view and also the joy because they coexist on the top of Meditation Mountain. So you may think you're going up there for the peace, but you'll also see the view and experience the happiness. You may think you're going up there for the view, but you'll also ex experience the peace and the happiness. Right, little bit of the dog, you're only going up there for the happiness. But even the dog experienced the peace and the great view. Because those three things coexist on the top of Meditation Mountain. The stillness, the insight, and the bliss. You can't separate them. <laughs> yes. of the Dharmapada one of my favourite verses because that says Nati Jano Apanyasa Panya Nati Ajayatoi Yam Hi Jano Cha Panya Cha So Ve Nibbana Santike which means there is no jhana without insight there is no insight without jhana but one who has both insight and jhana they are in the presence of Nibbāna. You need jhāna to become enlightened. That's why, to how many people, please look at the sutras, the teaching of the Buddha. Don't just listen to a monk or a nun, no matter how famous they are. Look at what the Buddha said. And there you see eightfold path. It's the only way to become enlightened. If the Buddha, he was supposed to be the most compassionate person, if any one of those factors wasn't necessary, out of compassion and wisdom, he would have given us the sevenfold path. Or a sixfold path. The reason the eightfold path, because every one of those is necessary. And number eight, sama samadhi. All the time, every occasion, Every time he talked about samadhi, sama samadhi, it was first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, and fourth jhana. That was the eighth factor of the eightfold path, jhana. So if we say that jhana is not necessary, we're saying there's only a sevenfold path. You know, that's one of the reasons why many people, they don't get enlightened. Simply because they miss out one factor here, one factor there. That's why it doesn't happen. But anyway, what are the jhanas anyway? They are just what happens when you let go. They're not stages of attachment. They're stages of letting go. That's why the wonderful thing, you know, you've all heard my teachings and you've heard the sort of teachings I teach the monks last night as you let go more and more and more things just fade away you let go of the past and future and you're timeless you let go of thinking and you're silent you let go of the breath and the rest of the body you can't feel the body you can't hear sounds all that's left is the mind that's when you see these beautiful lights in the mind and images. And when they stabilize and become very brilliant and bright and you go inside them, that's the jhanas. But you try and do that, and it's impossible. You just let it happen, and it occurs. They're all stages of letting go. And letting go is a path to enlightenment. 
So jhanas are actually milestones on the journey in to enlightenment. You have to go past them and through them. There is no other way. You can't just... This is what the Buddha simile says. You can't get into enlightenment without jhanas. No more than you can get to the heartwood of a tree, its pith, without going through the bark and the sap. You have to, to go that way. So that's actually Buddhist simile. So it is actually messy. Unfortunately, that sometimes that people, out of compassion, at once want to give you the easy way. Well, the easy way. You know, like those shortcuts which people have told me. Every time I have a shortcut, whether it's in Kuala Lumpur or whether it's anywhere else, it always takes far more time. <laughs> So don't try the shortcut. Do the good old-fashioned eightfold path. It's the best way. Yes. <laughs> okay. Please. These are stages of letting go. You don't get stuck. But you can hang out there a long time. And I always refer people again to the word of the Buddha. Look in the Pasadika Sutta of the Diga Nikaya. Pasadika Sutta, Diga Nikaya. There you will find the Buddha answered that question. He said, if anyone says, oh, now what happens if you really indulge in the bliss of the four jhanas? You will tell them, said the Buddha, that anyone who indulges in the joy of the bliss of the jhanas can only expect one of four consequences. Only four things will happen to you if you get attached to the jhanas. And those four things are stream winning, once returning, non-returning, or arahat, full enlightenment. So read that. It's very clear. That's what it states. So anyone says, oh, if you get stuck in the jhanas, I say, yes, if you get stuck in the jhanas, the Buddha said that, you get enlightened. One of the four stages. That's the only things which happen to you. That's a great answer. Because that's what happens. You're attached, stuck to letting go. You let go more and more and more, be more and more free. The best thing is actually why I teach meditation is so that you can experience those jhanas. They're not just things for monks. Lay people get them as well. But once you achieve one of those jhanas yourself, you can understand, you feel that this is a taste of freedom. Vimuti rasa. This is where you really get insight. Insight in what it's like to be free. The deeper simile which I always give, which shows what insight really is, is the old, the people who listen to my talks a lot, especially in the monastery, know this simile so well. It's the simile of the tadpole. Once upon a time, there was a little tadpole, and she was born in this nice lake, but she was a very smart tadpole, and she was always interested in the Dhamma. So she went to listen to the frogs when they talked about Dhamma. She even went to Abhidharma class and learnt a lot about the Dhamma. <laughs> but one thing which she could never really get her head around was water. They talked a lot about water, H2O, it flows. But she couldn't understand that. The reason was... Little tadpole was born in the water, had spent all her life in the water. It was always around little tadpole. So how can the little tadpole really know what water is? But you know what happened one day? The little tadpole started to sprout some legs and some little arms. And those grew and grew. The little tadpole grew into a frog. And once it was a frog, one day, 
She didn't really know what she was doing. She jumped out of the lake and was standing on dry land. Now that was a very strange experience for Tadpole, now Mrs. Frog. It was totally unlike every experience she had before. And she realized, ah, I'm out of the lake, standing on dry land. Now I know what water is. That thing which is now missing, which is gone, which has vanished. Now I know what water is. And that's the only way a frog can understand water. Fishes can never understand water because they're immersed in it all the time. When it vanishes, then you understand what it is. So your body, can you understand what it really is? No, because you're immersed in it. Your five senses, they're there all the time for you. You can't understand them until they vanish. So you jump out of the lake of the five senses onto the dry land of jhana. And afterwards you have the experience in the jhanas. The experience of being apart from the five senses. Just like the frog, the experience of being free of water. Now I understand what it is. Now you understand it's all seeing, hearing, smelling, touching. It's all suffering. Inherently. That's why when people die and have these out of body experiences, oh, I should say free. I haven't got a body anymore. You don't know that until you've died. How painful it is, even in the best possible health, how much of a heavy, painful burden having five senses is. And then, when you get into the second jhana, that's the first time the little tadpole goes out of the water, but what's missing this time is your will. That's the thing which is quite significant with the second jhana experience and above. The will has totally vanished. Only now can you understand what the will is. Choice, doing. Before the second jhana and above experiences, the will has always been there for you. You're immersed in it. You don't understand what it truly is. Many of you think it's your friend. Many of you use it for your happiness, even for using it to try and get enlightened. But won't you understand what will truly is? When you get out of the, the realm of will and standing on the dry land where there's no will left, second, third, fourth jhanas, then you understand what it truly is. It wasn't your friend after all. It was your number one enemy. But you can't see that now. Because it's there for you, immersed in it. You've always had it there. Sometimes you haven't used it, but it's always there. Second jhana, it vanishes. Now you have insight. The jhanas give you the data for insight to happen. They also abandon the hindrances so when you emerge you can understand what that data means. But most importantly, it gives you this amazing data. Just like the tadpole becoming a frog, jumping onto dry land. Now, they can understand what water is. That is why no way can you get those deep insights without jhana. No way can a tadpole understand water. No way can a a fish understand water. Da, da, da. So you're all little tadpoles, but I'm going to make you into frogs. <laughs> Jumping out into dry land. That's why this experience is very weird. You get into the jhana first of all, and you come back and say, what the heck was that? That was so different. Yes. It is of death, yes, because if you ever noticed on the path into jhanas, if you heard me talk, you've read my books, one of those stages just before jhanas is seeing the nimitta, this beautiful light which appears in the mind. And that usually appears when the five senses 
stop. And then these are incredibly weak. So you're not hearing, you're not smelling, seeing, you're not smelling, tasting, or physical touch. Your body disappears. It's beautiful light in the mind. Does that ring any bells for you? When's the other time people see a bell when the five senses aren't working? See, see a light, rather. When you die, how the body experiences. You die and you go towards the light. That's exactly the same experience. So doing jhanas is very similar to dying. It's what I sometimes call dying practice. You know, you, when you get married, you have to sort of you know go to marriage practice first of all, counselling, you know, what to do. You know, with a sociologist, you know, when you learn how to play a guitar, you have to sort of go to a teacher first of all. And you have to practice first of all. Anything else you do in life, you know, you have to go to, to um, classes to learn how to do it. So meditation is like learning how to die. And this is dying 101. <laughs> jhana. It's otherwise called jhana. So there's a lot of similarities there. Because you're letting go of your body. And it's temporarily dying to your body. Dying to your past. Dying to your future. So that's what death is like. Things are disappearing. Go on, Daniel. <laughs> I know you can't resist asking questions. you can see that creation is craving. This is a force of creating. And even you know, in theoretical physics, that movement of the mind to observe, to want to observe, collapses the Schrodinger equation and changes the quantum world of just probabilities into what we know as experience. Even in science I learned that. But in particular, you can see just how you create your worlds. You create karmically. So if you want to be healthy and happy, or if you want to be sick, you can create that. It's amazing how many people can create sickness because of negativity. You create the cancer. You create the health, the longevity, or the death. Much of your life you create craving for karma. Understanding this this is the creator, not a god. You are the creator, each one of us. We create this world. Therefore our desire and our ill will. And once you sort of see that framework, you experience so much. You know, whether it's I heard there have been riots in London, whether there are uh, terrorism, it's all craving. Wanting it creates. You can create a you can create a beautiful world or a hell world. Because that's in our power. That craving creates. And that death, the craving doesn't stop. We still carry on creating. We create our future births. We create those realms. That's why often that people used to ask me, after death, how can there be a hell world? Now, because traditionally, what I heard when I started off didn't make much sense to me. They said there were these realms of God, the Yama gods. And at death, they will look at you, Victor, this is what you've done and what you've not done, so this is where you've got to go. And sometimes that people are very bad and they get sent to hell. And I thought, what God would ever send anybody to hell? If I was a God, and say that Adolf Hitler or Osama bin Laden would come up, say, oh, never mind, Osama, you know, you're not just a bad guy, just a bit deluded, but, you know, I'll forgive you, and go up to heaven. If it was me, I'd send everybody to heaven, no matter how bad they were. That's my character. <coughs> and that's what a God does. Our gods are loving. They're not vindictive. So I thought, how on earth could that happen? How could anybody, any high-minded being, send someone to hell? never made sense. And after a lot of 
contemplation, I realize the only person who sends you to hell is yourself. That when you die, if you've done some bad things you're very ashamed of and feel very guilty, you will want to be punished. It will self-punishment. And you will create a realm for however long you want, however long you think, think you deserve to punish yourself. And because these are mind-made bodies when you die, and it's much longer, and sometimes whatever you think you des what you deserve, that's what you give yourself. And it's total craziness. All you need to do is to forgive. You don't need to send yourself to hell. doesn't matter what you've done. And if you have that beautiful forgiveness, you never need to send yourself to hell again. Or to any lower realm. That's one of the insights which comes with being a stream runner. The ability you don't need to be punished anymore. You can forgive, there's no self in there. Which was answering one of those questions which always fascinated me. Why is it that when you're a stream runner, you can never be reborn in the lower realms? The reason is you've seen non-self and you realise no need to punish. When there's a self there, there's guilt and punishment. That's part of having a self. Blaming others, blaming yourself. When there's no self there, there's no one to blame. Forgiveness can occur. So there's no need to send yourself back. You don't create those realms. Send heaven realms. Then, you know, you've read the suttas. You know, what's the next realm up? It's the realm of the four great kings. Above this realm, and above the four great kings, there is a realm of the 33, and above the 33, there's the Tusita realm, and above the Tusita realm, there's the Yama realm, above the Yama realm, and the Manarati realm, which is the light in other people's creations, and then the ones which have willpower in other people's creations, and you get the Brahma realm. Is that fixed forever? So I thought, in the realm of the 33, what happens if one of those you know, dies or gets in line and becomes the realm of the 32? Or if someone else gets you know, promoted up there, the realm of the 34, and you know you hear of what it was like there, and it's just medieval, they had these palaces and with these lutes. My goodness, haven't they got electric guitars yet up in heaven? <laughs> I mean, it's obviously that people create the heaven realms for themselves. So if you want to go to heaven, what type of music do you like? That's what you will create. What type of food do you like? That's what you would create in your heaven realm. Even if you are sensual and you like still like sex, you would create the type of women that which you like, Victor, which may not be the type that you like. So your heavens will be totally different. You know, if you want to create some heaven realm for the ladies, you know, maybe like all all the men that were like Justin Bieber, all willing to serve your every need. If that's what you like, that's what you create. You create those things. So you create the heaven realms and the hell realms for your craving and for your ideas of what you think happiness and fulfillment are or what you think you deserve. So see that whole power of creation through craving and see just how we create worlds and worlds and realms, heavens and hells, we create them. So they're still being created. The hell realms today are not the same as the hell realms later on. Uh, the hell realms today are not the same as the hell realms of the time of the Buddha. Neither are the heaven realms. They've all changed. 